But let's just read from Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And I'm going to read from verse 23. Now follow with me in the reading. Acts chapter 4 verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David have said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, Against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Amen. We trust and pray that God will bless this reading of the Holy Scriptures to us. Let's just unite together ever so briefly in prayer. Lord, we just want to thank thee today for the sense of thy presence with us. And we're conscious that today is a time to remember. And we thank thee for the participation of the Bible class and the Sunday school already in our service. And Lord, we've heard thy word. And oh God, we've heard messages and song. And even instrumentally in our minds have been taken up with Christ. And Lord, surely this is a day and an hour to remember what this season of the year is really all about. And we just look to thee now that thou will undertake for us. We thank thee for thy precious word that's been read in our hearing. Lord, we believe that thy word is an inerrant and infallible and inspired, authoritative, sufficient record for us. And O God, we just look to thee that thou will help us to embrace it as such. We ask thee today again that they'll remember those that are absent from us, those that have been in and out of hospital, like our brother Graham. You'll meet his need and you'll be with him today. And even though he's sad, he's missing the service, that we pray that you'll strengthen him in his soul. Do you remember Joshua as well with tonsillitis? We pray that he'll be healed quickly. Remember others that can't be here for a variety of reasons. Uh, and Lord, we pray thy blessing to be upon them. Remember the shut-in ones, the sick ones. Minister grace to them in their home. Uh, remember those that uh, are, are working today. Undertake uh, and give much needed grace. And we pray that soon they'll be enabled to be out in fellowship with us here. We look to thee, Lord, for souls to be saved at this Christmas time. We look to thee, Lord, that you'll answer prayer for the additional new families for the work of God. We thank thee again for the tremendous gift of £20,000 last week for the building fund. And we pray, Lord, for additional money for the building work that it might progress and go on. We thank thee for the building work thus far. Remembering the builder and the ongoing progression of the material uh, need uh, and the site next door. We thank thee for all the safety that thou was afforded uh, the builder. And we just look to thee for thy continual hand of blessing. We, we thank you for those that are talking about the building in the community down below us. And we just pray that from that community that thou would draw many people in. And that they might stand up at this time for the precious and lovely name of the Lord Jesus. We would pray again that thou remember thy servant, Pastor McConnell. And, O oh God, you know all about the court case, the decision of the magistrate. You know about his time, a reflection upon this case. We pray, Lord, that you'll intervene, you'll undertake. You'll behold the threatenings of the world against the church. And, O oh God, you'll meet our need at this time. And whatever the outcome is, we pray that we'll accept and know that this indeed is the, the will of God. 
Uh, Lord, that thou hast allowed it in thy sovereign eternal purpose. Uh, and, O oh Lord, it's for thy glory uh, and for the good of thy church. Visit thy church at this time. Visit our own denomination at home and abroad. Lord, we need a mighty outpouring of thy spirit. Lord, we need repentance. Uh, we need to admit, Lord, where we have went wrong and, uh, uh, and done wrong. Uh, Lord, we need a spirit of honesty to know where we're at. Uh, and, Lord, give us much grace, even the leadership of the church. <laughs> And, O oh God, that you'll turn us again to thyself in such a way that we'll know the presence and power of God in our midst, that new free churches will be opened north and south of the border. And, O oh God, in the mainland, Lord, amidst all the spiritual darkness and wickedness, the light of Jesus Christ will shine forth. Lord, hear prayer. Undertake for us now. Just bless and be with us, even as we have this little time around thy word. Use it to speak afresh and anew to our hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my text this morning is taken from Acts chapter 4, verse 27, and the verse 30. And it's really four words. And my subject today is learning about the holy child, Jesus. If you look at verse 27, it says, Thy holy child, Jesus. And if you look at verse 30, it says, Thy holy child, Jesus. Now, I was asked this week by a couple, uh, What is Christmas story all about, Reverend McLaughlin? And I answered that straight away by saying, Well, it's all about the birth of Christ. You see, young people, it's not just about presents or about a holiday from school or family get-togethers or decorations in the home. But at its heart, it's all about the birth of Christ. Now, of course, we as a church, we don't believe that Jesus Christ was born on the 25th day of December. There's no evidence for that in the Scripture. But we do believe in his coming into the world. We believe in the mystery of his incarnation and in the doctrine of his virgin birth. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary at a precise point in history. And in the past, I've told you that I believe that this is the greatest message in the world. Uh, He said, I am come. The Savior's come. That's the message. And, of course, it's the greatest miracle in the world. It's the miracle of all miracles uh, for a virgin to be with child. And, of course, it's the greatest mystery because that child is Emmanuel, God in the flesh. And it's the great mercy. God has provided a saviour for sinners. Remember the angel Gabriel said to Joseph in a dream, Before the Saviour was born, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And one of the the boys from the Bible class read this morning in Luke chapter 2, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. Now, statisticians, those involved in surveys in the United Kingdom, They tell us that about roughly 12% of adults, that's those that are 18 and over, are familiar with the nativity story. That's the birth of Christ. 36% of children, that's those under 18, are familiar with the story. So, So let's think about that. Here's adults throughout the United Kingdom And 12% are familiar with the nativity story. 36% of children under 18 are familiar with it. But let me tell you something else that statisticians have come up with. 51% of adults that were surveyed have said that the nativity story, that's the birth of Christ, has absolutely no relevance for them. Now think of that. Why? 51% of the population, no relevance to the Christmas story. The birth of Christ. Ignorance of the word of God. Apathy. The rise of militant atheism. Humanism. False religions. 
We could name them Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, apostasy in the church. See, we live in a world, 2015, where a whole generation are growing up that don't know the basic facts of the Christian faith. They don't know the fundamentals of the faith. And sadly, they do not care. Neither the children, the young people, or the adults. And, and if we talk to them about these fundamental doctrines, like the doctrine of the incarnation, or the doctrine of the virgin birth, they don't know them. And yet these are central, and these are important, and these are foundational to the Christmas story. What is Christmas all about, boys and girls? It's about the birth of Christ. Now here in Acts chapter 4 that I've read to you, the church is facing persecution, and what the church did was they turned to the Lord in prayer, and twice in prayer, talking to God as Father, they used a particular title for Christ. They, they, they used the term, Thy Holy Child Jesus. Now, when the Holy Spirit records something twice in the Bible, Surely that highlights at least how important it is. What the Holy Spirit is saying here is, pick up your ears, pay close attention, listen carefully to what these men are saying. Here we're giving an insight into men in prayer. They're addressing God, and they're using this title, Thy Holy Child Jesus. And for just about 10 or 12 minutes, I want to share a couple of wee thoughts about Thy Holy Child Jesus. Notice the word thy. There's the paternity of the child. As I've said, these disciples were facing a period of persecution. This was a bad time for the church. There was loads of trials and troubles. They had faced hardship and difficulty. In fact, Peter and John had been arrested with others. They'd been put in prison for a night. They, they had been beaten. Now that, that is, they got a good thumping. And they were told when they were let go the next day, now we have a message for you boys. If you want more of the same, carry on what you're doing. Here's our advice to you. Don't speak or teach any more in the name of Jesus. Now, now think about it. These, these men had been imprisoned. They had been interrogated. They had been beaten. And now they're being threatened. And we read in verse 23 that they, when they were let go, went to their own company. And when they got there and told all the rest of the disciples what had happened, what did they do? They turned to the Lord in prayer. And you know, there's a great lesson for us to learn. Even at Christmas time, when you face trials and troubles, when hardship and difficulty comes, when you're in pain, or even when the church is being persecuted for righteousness sake, doing the right thing, what are we to do? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Go and tell the Lord all about it. That's what they were doing. You see, these disciples were addressing God in prayer. Look at verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which, make, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. You see, they're addressing God as Father. And, and, and in addressing God, they're saying to God, thy holy child. In other words, they were saying, Heavenly Father, we accept that Jesus Christ is your child. We accept that thou hast a paternal, fatherly relationship with the one whom we call Jesus. See, the Father gave him as a child, for unto us a child is given. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a son is born. Mark read that out for us. See, the Father didn't send an angel. He didn't send an archangel. He sent his only begotten son, the king of glory, the Lord of heaven and earth, the, 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 the only redeemer of sinners. Young people, that's of utmost importance in a day of apathy, in a day of ignorance and indifference, in a day of lawlessness, in a day of apostasy in the church. Let's remember that Jesus Christ, whose son is a he is God's son. Whose child is he? He's God's child. 
He was begotten, not made. He is God's everlasting son. Who are we dealing with when we think about the Christmas story? Who is he? Son of Mary? Yes. Son of man? Yes. But ultimately and primarily the son of God. And I just want to ask, do you know him? Is he your Lord and Saviour? Joseph was only his stepfather. Remember at the age of 12 when the Lord Jesus was in the temple? And, and Mary come to him and they were very distressed. They hadn't seen him for a whole day. And they supposed him to be in the company and he wasn't there. And they went looking for him. And when they found him in the temple, they said, um, we're very concerned about you. Uh, did you not know that your father and, uh, and, and I were, were looking for you? I remember he said, wist ye not I must be about my father's business. Do you know him? Do you honour him this morning? Are you willing to defend him? There's those who refuse to defend him. They want to deny him. There's those who refuse to honour him. They want to hate him. There's those who refuse to receive him. And in their heart, they, they reject him. But do you know who he is? He's God's son, thy son. There are, of course, many references explicitly that teach and tell us that Jesus Christ is God. And I haven't time to open up that this morning, but I, I tell you there's nine. Nine explicit references that tell us he is God. And that's who he is. Jesus is God's son, God in the flesh. <coughs> Notice quickly and secondly, the purity of the child. Now look at the word holy. Of a truth against thy holy child. You see, the Lord Jesus, and I say this um, with thought in my mind, is similar to every boy and girl here. Similar to every child. In other words, there was a day he was born. And of course, Christ was born naturally of a woman. He had a mother called Mary. And yet, supernaturally, because he was born of woman only, um, the Holy Spirit ha had a role in the birth of Christ. Luke 1, chapter, or Luke 1, verse 35. The child called Jesus grew. The child called Jesus gained wisdom naturally as far as his human nature is concerned. But let me tell you something different. He was a child who was not a sinner. This child was not guilty of one sin. He was a unique child. He was never punished for wrongdoing. He was never punished for being angry or telling lies or stealing. He never threw a temp temper tantrum. He never sought to deprive another child of a toy or a treat. He never did chores in a bad spirit or begrudgingly. He never over ate, so he wasn't greedy. He didn't even oversleep. He, he was never cruel towards his mother or his stepfather. He, he showed the utmost courtesy and respect. If you read the last part of Luke chapter 2, and that's the only view of the childhood of Christ that we have in the Bible. We're familiar with the first 20 verses, but the last few verses are very important. And here's the Spirit of God revealing what we need to know. Of course, there's much speculation about the childhood of Christ, what events took place, things that he did, but they're all without foundation in fact. All we need to know about the childhood of Christ is here. That's what God in his sovereignty and in his providence has revealed to us. And at the heart of that, this child was not a sinner. He did no sin, the Bible tells us. He knew no sin. In him was no sin. He's the sinless, spotless <laughs> son of God, the one who kept the law of God perfectly. If I this morning, uh, funny enough, I noticed this when I was down in town uh, on Thursday, a, a young couple standing looking into a jeweler's. And uh, of course, they were eyeing up the rings. They were walking down the street and of course, they were about to walk past. But the young girl had the boy by the arm and she swung him round till they were looking in the window. And of course, I thought to myself, she's sending out a message to that young fella. And I thought about that, you know, going into the jeweler's to buy an engagement ring. Could you just imagine that? 
What does the jeweller do? He just doesn't go to the cupboard and bring out a ring and say, here, here, try that on. He doesn't put his hand in his pocket and say, you know, I've got one here, it's special. No, no, I'll tell you what he does. The first thing he does is, once he knows they're coming to buy a ring, he gets a black velvet cloth and he puts it out on the counter. And then he brings a number of rings that he thinks are suitable and he puts them on the black velvet cloth. And of course, against the black cloth, the diamond ring dazzles and sparkles. Because that's a good jeweler. And he knows how to make a sale. He wants the, the diamond to stand out. And against the dark background of this world and all its moral and spiritual and melody and maze, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stands out. There's one pure Holy, sinless person who did no sin. No guile was found in his mouth. A holiness so wonderful that it's hard to take it in. Here he is. He's born as a child. The Bible tells us he reaches the age of 12. The Bible tells us then from 12 he, he, he's called into the ministry at 30. He died in the tree at age 33. Day in and day out, with all hell against him, and the devil hating him. And yet he could say, the prince of this world cometh, and of nothing in me. There's not one sin he can point to. The purity of the child. Notice, thirdly, the humanity of the child. I've thought about this word child. And even the hymn writer Philip Brooks would have this thought in mind when he said in that fourth uh, verse in the first line, O holy child of Bethlehem. You see, he, he was holy, but he was also a child. The Christ child. In Hebrews 10 and 5 we read, A body hast thou prepared for me. The word prepared means created out of nothing. The miracle of all miracles of sin. The Holy Ghost formed the child's body in the belly of the virgin. A child. Is there any reason to fear a child? Think of the honesty and the tenderness and the sympathy and the grace and the love that little children have. But it's all here. The humanity of the child. Think also of the nativity of the child. What's the greatest event in the world? Listening to the news and thinking about the, the man there, is it Tim Hawke and the International Space Station representing the United Kingdom? And I was thinking about, you know, the man landing on the moon in 1969 and uh, even thinking about some other great events in history uh, next year. It's the anniversary of the Battle of the Somme. Um, uh, 2017 is the uh, anniversary of Martin Luther uh, nailing the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg against the sale of indulgences. Uh, <coughs> and there's so many events, historically speaking, that we as the church can celebrate uh, and thank God for them. But what's the greatest event in the world? Man in the moon? A man living in an international space station? Or some great event in battle in the past? No, the greatest event was that God was born in the earth. The greatest event is that God walked on the earth. And you know the doctrine of the incarnation. The, the doctrine of the virgin birth. The fact that Christ lived in Nazareth. Born in Bethlehem. The fact that he had a public ministry at the age of 30. The fact that he died in the tree. All these things tie into this truth that God was born in the earth, that God walked on the earth in the likeness of man, in the likeness of sinful man, and he was God with us. Here's the identity of the child. Jesus. The name Jesus was chosen by God. Jo not Joseph. He was told by the angel Gabriel, thou shalt call his name Jesus. That's what he's to be called. This baby that's in Mary's belly, you're going to call him Jesus. The just one, the eternal one, the sent one, the unique one. 
the saving one. Think of his name on your lips, in your mind, on your heart. Not as a swear word, but as a sweet word. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. There's the identity of the child, folks. Think of the ministry of the child. Why had he come? Well, the answer is he came to save. God saves sinners. And how does he do that? He does that, he does that in the personal work of his son. He saves every soul he has planned to redeem from all eternity. Remember what Joseph was told? Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Not in them. There'll be a change. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And isn't it wonderful that Jesus takes you as you are? You come as a sinner and you cry out, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved, Lord. Lord, I've got a soul. And when Jesus takes you as you are, he doesn't leave you as you are. He changes you. That's how much he loves us. There's the ministry of Christ. And it's all tied in here to his birth. And I want you to think of one final thought. The humility of a child. They're praying to their heavenly father. And whose name are they praying in? The name of Jesus. Look, look at verse 30 as we finish. That signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, <coughs> Jesus. You see, they had taken into their mind the birth of Christ. The paternity of the child. He's God's son. The purity. He's the absolute sinless, spotless one. His humanity. He's a child. He had bone of our bone and and flesh of our flesh. His identity, we know who he is. He's Jesus. That's bound up in his ministry. And here's the humility. Even though he's one in essence with the Father. For he said, I and thy Father are one. In other words, he's equal to the Father. We believe in God the Son and God uh, the Holy Spirit and God the Father, three and one and one and three. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. But the Son, he adopted a most humble position in that he was willing to become the mediator. And therefore we can pray to the Father in his name. And that's what he wants us to do. And that's what the disciples were doing in their time of trouble and their day of need. We close our prayers in Jesus' name. Not just out of a matter of form, but because that's the practice of the early church. In fact, that's what he told us to do. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Why? Because he's the mediator. He has taken that possession. Even though he's equal with the Father, he is, he is in, the, in, the, in the work of God, taking the role and the place of the mediator. In other words, he had, a, he had a true humility. I trust this morning that as you've thought about these words, thy holy child Jesus, that when you think of Christmas time, and if someone says to you, even as a child, what's it all about? You'll be able to say, Thy holy child Jesus. God's holy child Jesus. That's what Christmas means to me. That's what it ought to mean to you. May the Lord bless these few thoughts.